Live from San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at VMworld 2014. Brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. Here live in San Francisco, California, this is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, with my co-host Dave Vellante, our next guest, Michael Haig, VMware Alliance Manager for HP. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Um, hot topic is VVols. So, obviously storage at the center of all the action in VMware. Um, cloud, mobile, social, software-defined data center, hybrid cloud, et cetera, et cetera, moving up the stack. Application-centric theme is certainly yep. here. So, give us the 101 of VVols. What is it, why is it important, what's the key conversation? Sure, and, and maybe let's start. So, so VMware Virtual Volumes, maybe we kind of start with, with the, the motivation behind this new technology. It's, it's been one that, that's been the buzz. I mean, it's been a kind of a technology preview since I think 2011 at VMworld was the first time they showed it off. So it's been this, this, this technology that's been a long time in, in the comings. And, and, the, and the, the basis is, is what VMware found is that they, uh, their original architecture for storage based on, on these large data stores, these large LUNs from the storage system, it worked great. It allowed them to, to consolidate a lot of VMs, who have a lot of VM entities on, on a few storage resources. But the, the challenge with that is they realized as they, they kept going and looked at more management and policy-based management, is there was, a, there was a disconnect between the language storage spoke, which was at that LUN level, and what VMware wanted to speak, which is really at that VM-centric level. So with VVols, what they've, what they've done is they've developed an architecture from, from the ground up, really to, to fix that disconnect and provide a one-to-one -one mapping between the VMware world, where that talks VMs, and the storage system, which talks LUN. So you'll have, every VM will now have its own volume on the storage system. Okay, so, a lot of people watching will say, oh, I get it. A lot of people go, what the heck is Michael talking about? So LUN stands for logical unit yes. number. Okay, that doesn't mean anything to half the people out there. So let's unpack that and Fair really enough. do a 101. So talk about what, <laughs> the storage view of the world versus the VM view of the world and how VVols is bringing that together. So what's a LUN? You know, what's a volume? Let's get down to yeah, that level. Yeah, let's, let's dig down there. Them. So let's, let's start at the storage, and, and, and the way we work at the storage is again, we talk about these, these, these volumes or, or logical entities. So if you think of your laptop, you have a C drive. You put everything on this C drive. That's your volume of your computer. Some people may have two hard drives, so you have a C drive and a D drive. That same concept applies to enterprise storage. We have these entities, logical entities, where we kind of put all the, all the storage behind it. With large enterprise storage systems, we, we combine a lot of disks together and create these logical units, and that's where all the data goes. Talking about virtualization with, with VMware. When so, so let me just stop okay, you. So physically, the, the, the arrays might be distributed, but you can create a, a, a logical unit out of those distributed assets so you don't have to move data. Correct. Right, it's because moving data is a pain in the neck and it's slow and it's yep. expensive. Okay, great, so that's good. I, I like C drive, I get it, okay, good. Why, why is that a problem? Why do I need something better than that? So, so the challenge is, is again, so, so we the storage specifically at the block level, so we're talking about kind of different protocols of storage, there's your, your filers and your block storage. Um, from, from our standpoint, we, we know kind of what bits are where, but when you have an operating system, a hypervisor on, on top of that, that, that file system knows where everything is. We the storage layer, all we know, all we see are zeros and ones essentially. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's decrypting that zero and one, zeros and ones is what the file system does. And that's where historically the virtual machine file system from VMware kind of sat on that large entity from the storage system and, and controlled, kind of understood where everything went. And that, from that level, they put multiple VMs in this one unit. And they put them all over the place. We at the storage level don't know what they were putting where. So if you as a, as a user have, let's say your, your Microsoft Exchange application and let's say your Oracle application running, then we don't know what bits, kind of what blocks, what pieces of our storage go with which application. Okay, and that's a problem because it, it, it creates overhead labor cost, essentially, to try to figure that out and performance tune or move yeah, data. Yeah, and, and the, the, the big problem is, is not so much that, that we don't know, that, that's fine, it's the storage layer provides a lot of advanced data service, so we do have a lot of capabilities at the storage level, so things like replication, snapshots, you want to create a copy of your data. Right. So, from our standpoint now, from the VMware standpoint, we want to be able to copy on a per VM basis. But, but unfortunately, you're locked into a LUN, and so you got to take those services and say, okay, these services apply to this logical yes, to unit. This big basket of things. Uh, but I want that service with that application, yes. and, this and I want to drive quality of service. I can't do that exactly. without a lot of heavy lifting. 
Yep, exactly. Right? I mean, the other way we describe it is kind of this, this, you have this big basket of, of, of VMs or basket of eggs. And in today's world, you have to, if you wanted to paint an egg, you have to paint all the eggs the same color. <laughs> but let's say you want to paint the eggs different colors. Right, so I want we need to one kind of green, one blue, yeah. one red for, you know, and one white for each of my kids. Exactly, exactly. You know, we try to be fair. Okay, great. So, VVOLs essentially will allow you to, to expose those storage services yes. so that they can be consumed at a, at a virtual machine level. Yep. So that then you can al align the services with the virtual machine and create quality of service and maybe charge for it if you're a service provider exactly. or an internal service provider. And the result is going to be a, a lot greater simplicity for my IT operations and better, better service for my customers. Definitely. That's the bottom line, right? Yep. Okay, that's good. Thank you for that description. Um, why is it taking so long? You know, that, that's a, a great question. It has been in, in the works for a while. I, I think fundamentally uh, it, it's uh, completely kind of re-architecting the, the storage system, just proved to be, I mean, it, it's a big challenge. Not only that, but VMware does a great job. They have a number of storage partners, and, and everybody approaches storage a, a little differently. So kind of the original plan of, of hey, let's kind of have this, this one way of doing things, they realize, no, maybe HP 3FAR does it one way, storage vendor B does it a little differently. There can't be kind of a one-fit, one, kind of one fit. So there had to be a lot of customizations that I think went into it. And then also, as that VMware stack has gotten more advanced, they realized that vSphere is now kind of creating that, that fundamental infrastructure of their software-defined data center and user computing, cloud. There's a lot of pieces within the VMware stack it now touches, and they had to make sure it was ready for that. So this is a big win for a block storage provider, so good news for, for you guys, you know, 3PAR and, and other parts of your portfolio, and others, uh, because, because generally VMware has utilized NFS, you know, as the sort of default, right? So it's... So, Close, so, I, yeah. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll so dig into that, yeah. Does this, I guess my question is, does this level the playing field between block devices and, and say NAS devices being equal, sort of on an equal playing field? The shorter answer is, is yes. Um, historically, the, the discussion between block and file has been a big discussion with, with, with VMware. They, they created their, VMware, their file system to run on block storage. So that was the, the first storage they supported. But then as, as filers emerged, they, real, they, they realized that they wanted to be able to support that, that storage architecture. And, and because files, uh, because VMware is, is based on, on files, the, the filer could actually see the individual VMs. They could actually do that decoding we talked about. Like they could pull those eggs out of the basket individually in the past. So when it came to, to technologies, to storage technologies like replication, they could do that on, on a per VM basis easier than, than the block storage. Mm -hmm. Even though fiber channel block storage has been the, the, still the, the dominant use for vSphere. Now with VVOLs, it, it definitely levels that field, that playing field. VMFS goes out the window, both, both NFS, block, will now live on the same storage architecture. So all those advantages kind of go out the window, so we'll all have the same ability to, to see things on a per VM basis and have that same level of granularity. Now, you remember, you remember well, I'm sure, of VAAI and VASA in the last three or four or five years, I guess, let's see, it's been probably yep. four years now maybe three or four years with the, the storage integration wars, let's call it, <laughs> discussions is maybe a better term. But the issue was that you had to get a, an SDK from VMware, um, which they didn't necessarily have to give to everybody because they had the resources to support that, but anyway, the cartel got it. You know, HP, <laughs> EMC, NetApp, <laughs> IBM, the big guys, Dell, a few others. Um, 3 Power actually got it early on, we, we did which was interesting. You guys were a smaller Absolutely. company, but you got, you got in there. You got, the camel's nose was under that tent somehow, um, which I think speaks to the architecture right, yeah. and its affinity with VMware. But at any rate, um, there was a lot of work being done on, on integration with, with VMware APIs. So, are we now moving to a sort of a new battleground, I'll call it, a new integration battleground where VVOLs, you know, uh, uh, interaction is, is the new fundamental way to do things? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. VVOLS inherently is, is, is a framework. I mean, it's this, this new storage platform that the storage vendors can, can integrate it's to. It's not a solution. It, it's, it's, not <laughs> a, it's not like VA where once you did it, you're, you're done. I mean, yeah. once you support the different SCSI commands, right. kind of different commands of VA, you're done, check mark, let's move on. With, with VVOLS, it's this fundamental layer where now we can, as a storage vendor, provide all of our unique capabilities through this layer and then those show up in VMware storage policy based management, these policies that they, they've introduced to, to control storage. And, and, and that this, this will be this ongoing ability to, to, as storage vendors, kind of innovate, create new features from our side, like our, our dedupe capabilities, and then all the capabilities we've announced recently, will now be able to have those shine through this VVOLS layer, 
and show up right in vCenter when you're, you're creating VMs and choosing your storage policy. So there's differentiation is what you're saying. So in other words, yeah. um, the differentiation with VAI was, yeah, of course, in the array itself and how things were done, but you're saying it was, it was binary. Once you supported Pretty that close. capability, you had it, checkbox, okay, done. It sounds like this is different. So, so while it may level the playing field between block and file, are you, are you arguing that it actually creates differentiation between block array companies? I definitely think it has the opportunity to create that differentiation. Well, I, how I, so? Let's, let's unpack that. Yeah, again, th those, you'll now again be able to create these, these policies which will be based on all the capabilities of the storage and every storage vendor has, has different capabilities. So, so from, from the three parts, let's use an example, we have our, our ASIC that's built in, that's inside the box that provides a lot of our advanced services. Deduplication will be in line in our ASIC we do things like zero detect to allow you to keep an efficient thin system. So to kind of pull out zeros and, and keep your volumes efficient. We'll actually, we're going to be providing that zero detect as one of these capabilities to, to VMware. And so as when you, as a vSphere admin, as, as a system admin, if you're creating a VM, you can now choose a policy, say, hey, I want to make sure this VM has zero detect. Like I want to make sure it remains as efficient as possible over time. And anytime zeros are written, it gets pulled out. That will be visible by the system admin, the vSphere admin. If 3PAR is the only vendor, for example, that, that has that capability, then that selection will automatically go to 3PAR if you have multiple storage in your system. So, so at this point, both storage admins and now vSphere admins, systems admins, will now be able to see kind of all these capabilities and choose what, they, what their underlying storage does. So I'm going to build a portfolio of services if I'm a sysadmin or a VMware admin based upon the underlying uh, 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 infrastructure and the services that, that, that they provide to yep. me. So I'm going to pick and choose. Uh, and then I might even choose to offer one over the other, or maybe I'll have different classes of service exactly. depending upon you know, the, the quality of the implementation. Yeah, and, and the one thing that we, we haven't necessarily touched on too much is, is VVOLS also makes all the, the storage provisioning simpler. That happens automatically behind the scenes. So when you create a VM and choose to apply it to, to VVOLS, all the, the, basically the storage work, kind of the, the setup, basically formatting your C drive, going back to the, the laptop example, kind of installing this new hard drive, that, all that provisioning happens automatically. So the storage admin no longer has to provision these, these big baskets, these big data stores anymore. It just happens seamlessly behind the scenes with the integration we've done. So the vSphere admin will real now actually be, when they create a VM, will also be provisioning storage and doing kind of storage tasks even though they don't know it. So, let's, from a VMware perspective, where are we? So it's sort of 2011, I think it was like, they showed a little leg, wow, yep. VVOLS, so it's coming. And then yesterday, Pat talked about um, VVOLS as being part of vSAN 2.0 maybe, right? So, so uh, but in beta, I mean, it's still a long way to go, it feels like. Let me give the, the party line, I don't want to speak, speak for VMware. Uh, currently, VVOLS is available in, in the vSphere beta. So, okay. so if you're a vSphere beta user today, you can, you can deploy, run, run vSphere, it'll have VVOLS in there. If your underlying array that you have, and that they announced three, three storage vendors are on the beta site today, HP 3 par being one of those, you can use, use VVOLS today and, and it's available. You can start, start playing around with it in your lab. Only three vendors? Three vendors are available, only three vendors today who, are Who are the three vendors? Uh, HP 3 par <laughs> and then Dell, and uh, NetApp. HP 3 par Dell, and NetApp. Yes. No, no EMC? No EMC today. Interesting, okay. I thought the deck was stacked for EMC. A lot of people think <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, all right, we'll have, to, we'll have to dig into that a little later. <laughs> um, all right, well that's great. I mean, you know, it's interesting. 3PAR, like I said, is always, even before the HP acquisition, 3PAR was kind of in the club. We did right? a good job of leveraging our, our strong kind of, at, at, I mean, service providers, kind of that, that core cloud customers at the time that VMware was also going after. So we had some very vocal uh, joint customers that helped make sure we were, we were in the door and did a good job. We were the first with Boss of, one of the first with the AI. Well, we were here when, uh, when the de first Dell bid came down, John, you remember that? Yeah, that and was five years ago, VMworld yeah. 2010. We were sitting at the desk and boy, things were scrambling. Was it 2010 or was it 2011? 20, 2010. 2010. 2010? 2010, yeah. 2010 remember? That was right, 2010, <laughs> wow. You've also been, compellent. Compellent, remember five, compellent yeah. dropped right after. Uh, well, that was the prediction, right? Yeah. When Dell lost out to HP. Bridesmaid. We know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thanks for sharing the data. Good on bridesmaid, the, on come on, that's good bridesmaid. Still good, yeah. <laughs> Capella was cool. Hey, you know, <laughs> at least they're in the party. Um, not looking on the outside. So, VVOLS is big, thanks for sharing the data. Obviously, automation, DevOps, this is where the future's going. You know, eliminating all these complexities, manual, provisioning, all that stuff's going to go away. Appreciate it, Michael. This is theCUBE, you're watching live in San Francisco, here at VMworld, three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We're in the midst of day two, fifth year. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>